The Old Die Rich by H. L. Gold. Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Carter. X minus one project. The Old Die Rich by H. L. Gold. Part Two. You'd call it a city, I suppose. There were enough buildings to make it one, but no city ever had so much greenery. It wasn't just tree-lined streets like Unter den Linden in Berlin, or islands covered with shrubbery like Park Avenue in New York. The grass and trees and shrubs grew around every building, separating them from each other by wide lawns. The buildings were more glass, or what looked like glass, than anything else. A few of the windows were opaque against the sun, but I couldn't see any shades or blinds. Some kind of polarizing glass or plastic? I felt uneasy being there, but it was a thrill just the same to be alive in the future, when I and everybody who lived in my day was supposed to be dead. The air smelled like the country. There was no foul gas boiling from the teardrop cars on the glass-level road. They were made of transparent plastic clear around and from top to bottom, and they moved along at a fair clip, but more smoothly than swiftly. If I hadn't seen the airship overhead... I wouldn't have known it was there. It flew silently, a graceful ball without wings, seeming to be borne by the wind from one horizon to the other, except that no wind ever moved that fast. One car stopped nearby, and someone shouted, "'Here we are!' Several people leaped out and headed for me. I didn't think. I ran. I crossed the lawn and ducked into the nearest building and dodged through long, smoothly-walled, shadowlessly lit corridors until I found a door that would open. I slammed it shut and locked it. Then, panting, I fell into a soft chair that seemed to form itself around my body, and felt like kicking myself for the bloody idiot I was. What in hell had I run for? They couldn't have known who I was. If I'd arrived in a time when people wore togas or bathing suits, there would have been some reason for singling me out. But they had all had clothes just like ours. Suits and shirts and ties for the men, a dress and high heels for the one woman with them. I felt somewhat disappointed that clothes hadn't changed any, but it worked out to my advantage. I wouldn't be so conspicuous. Yet why should anyone have yelled, Here we are, unless... No, they must have thought I was somebody else. It didn't figure any other way. I had run because it was my first startled reaction, and probably because I knew I was there on what might be considered illegal business. If I succeeded, some poor inventor would be done out of his royalties. I wished I hadn't run. Besides making me feel like a scared fool, I was sweaty and out of breath. Playing old men doesn't make climbing down fire escapes much tougher than it should be, but it doesn't exactly make a sprinter out of you, not by several lungfuls. I sat there, breathing hard and trying to guess what next. I had no more idea of where to go for what I wanted than an ancient Egyptian set down in the middle of Times Square with instructions to sneak a mummy out of the Metropolitan Museum. I didn't even have that much information. I didn't know any part of the city, how it was laid out, or where to get the data that May Roberts had sent me for. I opened the door quietly and looked both ways before going out. After losing myself in the cross-connecting corridors a few times, I finally came to an outside door. I stopped, tense, trying to get my courage. My inclination was to slip, sneak, or dart out, but I made myself walk away like a decent, innocent citizen. That was one disguise they'd never be able to crack. All I had to do was act as if I belonged to that time and place, and who would know the difference? There were other people walking as if they were in no hurry to get anywhere. I slowed down to their speed, but I wished wistfully that there was a crowd to dive into and get lost. A man dropped into step and said politely, "'I beg your pardon, are you a stranger in town?' I almost halted in alarm, but that might have been a giveaway. "'What makes you think so?' I asked, forcing myself to keep at the same easy pace. "'I uh, didn't recognize your face, and I thought, "'It's a big city,' I said coldly. You can't know everyone. If there's anything I can do to help. I told him there wasn't, and left him standing there. It was plain common sense, I had decided quickly while he was talking to me, not to take any risks by admitting anything. I might have been dumped into a police state, or the country could have been at war without my knowing it, or maybe they were suspicious of strangers. For one reason or another, ranging from vagrancy to espionage, I could be pulled in, tortured, executed, God knows what. The place looked peaceful enough, but that didn't prove a thing. I went on walking, looking for something I couldn't be sure existed, in a city I was completely unfamiliar with, in a time when I had no right to be alive. 
It wasn't just a matter of getting the information she wanted. I'd have been satisfied to hang around until she pulled me back without the data. But then what would happen? Maybe the starvation cases were people who had failed her. For that matter, she could shoot me and send the remains anywhere in time to get rid of the evidence. Damn it, I didn't know if she was better or worse than I'd supposed. But I wasn't going to take any chances. I had to bring her what she wanted. There was a sign up ahead. It read, To Shopping Center. The arrow pointed along the road. When I came to a fork and wondered which way to go, there was another sign, then another pointing to still more farther on. I followed them to the middle of the city, a big square with a park in the center and shops of all kinds rimming it. The only shop I was interested in said Electrical Appliances. I went in. A neat young salesman came up and politely asked me if he could do anything for me. I sounded stupid even to myself, but I said, No, thanks, I'd just like to do a little browsing, and gave a silly nervous laugh. Me, an actor, behaving like a frightened yokel. I felt ashamed of myself. He tried not to look surprised, but he didn't really succeed. Somebody else came in, though, for which I was grateful, and he left me alone to look around. I don't know if I can get my feelings across to you. It's a situation that nobody would ever expect to find himself in, so it isn't easy to tell what it's like, but I've got to try. Let's stick with the ancient Egyptian I mentioned a while back, the one ordered to sneak a mummy out of the Metropolitan Museum. Maybe that'll make it clearer. The poor guy has no money he can use, naturally, and no idea of what New York's transportation system is like, where the museum is, how to get there, what visitors to a museum do and say, the regulations he might unwittingly break, how much an ordinary citizen is supposed to know about which customs, and such. Now add the possible danger that he might be slapped into jail or an insane asylum if he makes a mistake, and you've got a rough notion of the spot I felt I was in. Being able to speak English doesn't make much difference. Not knowing what's regarded as right and wrong and the unknown consequences are enough to panic anybody. That doesn't make it clear enough. Well, look, take the electrical appliances in that store. That might give you an idea of the situation and the way it affected me. The appliances must have been as familiar to the people of that time as toasters and TV sets and lamps are to us. But the things didn't make a bit of sense to me, any more than our appliances would to the ancient Egyptian. Can you imagine him trying to figure out what those items are for and how they work? Here are some gadgets you can puzzle over. There was a light fixture that you put against any part of a wall. No screws, no cement, no wires even. And it held there and lit up. And it stayed lit no matter where you moved it on the wall. Talk about pin-up lamps, this was really it. Then I came across something that looked like an ashtray with a blue electric shimmer obscuring the bottom of the bowl. I lit my pipe. Others I'd passed had been smoking, so I knew it was safe to do the same. And flicked in the match. It disappeared. I don't mean it was swirled into some hidden compartment. It vanished. I emptied the pipe into the ashtray, and that went, too. Looking around to make sure nobody was watching, I dredged some coins out of my pocket and let them drop into the tray. They were gone. Not a particle of them was left. A disintegrator? I haven't got the slightest idea. There were little mirror boxes with three tiny dials on the front of each. I turned the dials on one. It was like using three dial telephones at the same time. And a pretty girl's face popped onto the mirror surface and looked expectantly at me. Yes? she said, and waited for me to answer. I, um, wrong number, I guess, I answered, putting the box down in a hurry and going to the other side of the shop, because I didn't have even a dim notion how to turn it off. The thing I was looking for was on a counter. A tinted metal box, no bigger than a suitcase, with a lipped hole on top, and small undisguised verniers in front. I didn't know I'd found it, actually, until I twisted a vernier, and every light in the store suddenly glared, and the salesman came rushing over and politely moved me aside to shut it off. "'We don't want to burn out every appliance in the place, do we?' he asked quietly. "'I just wanted to see if it worked all right,' I said, still shaking slightly. "'It could have blown up or electrocuted me for all I knew. "'But they always work,' he said. "'Ah, always? Of course. The principle is simple, and there are no parts to get worn out, so they last indefinitely.' He suddenly smiled as if he'd just caught the gist. Oh, you were joking. Naturally. Everybody learns about the Dynapack in primary education. You were interested in acquiring one? No, 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 no. The old one is good enough. I was just, well, you know, um, interested in knowing if the new models are much different or better than the old ones. But there haven't been any new models since 2073, he said. Can you think of any reason why there should be? I guess not, I stammered, but you never can tell. 
"'You can with Dynapacks,' he said, and he would have gone on if I hadn't lost my nerve and mumbled my way out of the store as fast as I could. "'You want to know why? He'd asked me if I wanted to acquire a Dynapack, not buy one. I didn't know what acquire meant in that society. It could be anything from saving up coupons to winning whatever you wanted at some kind of lottery, or maybe working up the right number of labor units on the job, in which case he'd want to know where I was employed and the equivalent of Social Security and similar information, which I naturally didn't have, or it could just be fancy sales talk for buying. I couldn't guess, and I didn't care to expose myself any more than I had already, and my blunder about the Dynapack working and the new models was nothing to make me feel at all easier. Lord, the uncertainties and hazards of being in a world you don't know anything about. Daydreaming about visiting another age may be pleasant, but the reality is something else again. Wait a minute, friend! I heard the salesman call out behind me. I looked back as casually, I hoped, as the pedestrians who heard him. He was walking quickly toward me with a very worried expression on his face. I stepped up my own pace as unobtrusively as possible, trying to keep a lot of people between us, meanwhile praying that they'd think I was just somebody who was late for an appointment. The salesman didn't break into a run or yell for the cops, but I couldn't be sure he wouldn't. As soon as I came to a corner, I turned it and ran like hell. There was a sort of alley down the block. I jumped into it, found a basement door, and stayed inside, pressed against the wall, quivering with tension, and sucking air like a swimmer who'd stayed underwater too long. Even after I got my wind back, I wasn't anxious to go out. The place could have been cordoned off, with the police, the army, and the navy, all cooperating to nab me. What made me think so? Not a thing, except remembering how puzzled our ancient Egyptian would have been if he got arrested in the subway for doing something everybody did casually and without punishment in his own time. Spitting. I could have done something just as innocent, as far as you and I are concerned, that this era would consider a misdemeanor or a major crime. And in what age was ignorance of the law ever an excuse? Instead of going back out, I prowled carefully into the building. It was strangely silent and deserted. I couldn't understand why until I came to a lavatory. There were little commodes and wash basins that came up to barely above my knees. The place was a school. Naturally it was deserted. The kids were through for the day. I could feel the tension dissolve in me like a ramrod of ice melting, no longer keeping my back and neck stiff and taut. There probably wasn't a better place in the city for me to hide. A primary school? The salesman had said to me, Everybody learns about the Dynapack in primary education. Going through the school was eerie, like visiting a familiar childhood scene that had been distorted by time into something almost totally unrecognizable. There were no blackboards, teachers' big desk, children's little desks, inkwells, pointers, globes, or books, yet it was a school. The small fixtures in the lavatory downstairs had told me that, and so did the miniature chairs drawn neatly under the low, vividly painted tables in the various schoolrooms. A large, comfortable chair was evidently where the teacher sat when not wandering among the pupils. In front of each chair, firmly attached to the table, was a box with a screen, and both sides of the box held spools of wire on blunt little spindles. The spools had large, clear numbers on them. Near the teacher's chair was a compact case with more spools on spindles, and there was a large screen on the inside wall opposite the enormous windows. I went into one of the rooms and sat down in the teacher's chair, wondering how I was going to find out about the Dynapack. I felt like an archaeologist guessing at the functions of strange relics he'd found in a dead city. Sitting in the chair was like sitting on a column of air that let me sit upright or slump as I chose. One of the arms had a row of buttons. I pressed one and waited nervously to find out if I'd done something that would get me into trouble. Concealed lights in the ceiling and walls began glowing, getting brighter, while the room gradually turned dark. I glanced around bewilderedly to see why, because it was still daylight. The windows seemed to be sliding slightly, very slowly, and as they slid, the sunlight was damped out. I grinned, thinking of what my ancient Egyptian would make of that. I knew there were two sheets of polarizing glass, probably with a vacuum between to keep out the cold and the heat, and the lights in the room were beautifully synchronized with the polarized sliding glass. I wasn't doing so badly. The rest of the objects might not be too hard to figure out. The spools in the case alongside the teacher's chair could be wire recordings. I looked for something to play them with, but there was no sign of a playback machine. I tried to lift a spool off a spindle. It wouldn't come off. Ha! The wire led down the spindle to the base of the box, holding the spool in place. That meant the spools could be played right in that position. But what started them playing? I hunted over the box minutely. 
Every part of it was featureless, no dials, switches, or any unfamiliar counterparts. I even tried moving my hands over it, figuring it might be like a theremin, and spoke to it in different shades of command, because it could have been built to respond to vocal orders. Nothing happened. Remember the Poe story that shows the best place to hide something is right out in the open? Which is the last place anyone would look? Well, these things weren't manufactured to baffle people any more than our devices generally are. But it's only by trying everything that somebody who didn't know what a switch is would start up a vacuum cleaner, say, or light a big chandelier from a wall clear across the room. I'd pressed every inch of the box, hoping some part of it might act as a switch, and I finally touched one of the spindles. The spool immediately began spinning at a very low speed, and the screen on the wall opposite the window glowed into life. "'The history of the exploration of the solar system,' said an announcer's deep voice, "'is one of the most adventuresome in mankind's long list of achievements. Beginning with the crude rockets developed during World War II, there were newsreel shots of V-1 and V-2 being blasted from their takeoff ramps and a montage of later experimental models.' I wished I could see how it all turned out, but I was afraid to waste the time watching. At any moment I might hear the footsteps of a guard or janitor, or whoever tended buildings then. I pushed the spindle again. It checked the spool, which rewound swiftly and silently, and stopped itself when the rewinding was finished. I tried another. A nightmare underwater scene appeared. With the aid of energy screens, said another voice, the oceans of the world were completely charted by the year 2027. I turned it off, then another on developments in medicine, one on architecture, one on history, the geography of such places as the interior of South America and Africa that were or are unknown today, and I was getting frantic, starting the wonderful wire films that held full-frequency sound and pictures in absolutely faithful color, and shutting them off hastily when I discovered they didn't have what I was looking for. They were courses for children, but they all contained information that our scientists are still groping for and I couldn't chance watching one all the way through. I was frustratedly switching off a film on psychology when a female voice said from the door, May I help you? I snapped around to face her in sudden fright. She was young and slim and slight, but she could scream loud enough to get help. Judging by the way she was looking at me, outwardly polite and yet visibly nervous, that scream would be coming at any second. I must have wandered in here by mistake, I said, and pushed past her to the corridor, where I began running back the way I had come. "'But you don't understand!' she cried after me. "'I really want to help!' "'Yeah, help,' I thought, pounding toward the street door. "'A gag right out of that psychology film, probably. Get the patient to hold still, humor him, until you can get somebody to put him where he belongs. That's what one of our teachers would do, provided she wasn't too scared to think straight, if she found an old-looking guy thumbing frenziedly through the textbooks in a grammar school classroom. When I came to the outside door, I stopped.' I had no way of knowing whether she'd given out an alarm, or how she might have done it, but the obvious place to find me would be out on the street, dodging for cover somewhere. I pushed the door open and let it slam shut, hoping she'd hear it upstairs. Then I found a door, sneaked it open, and went silently down the steps. In the basement I looked for a furnace or a coal bin or a fuel tank to hide behind, but there weren't any. I don't know how they got their heat in the winter or cooled the building in the summer, probably some central atomic plant that took care of the whole city, piping in the heat or coolant in underground conduits that were led up through the walls, because there weren't even any pipes visible. I hunched into the darkest corner I could find and hoped they wouldn't look for me there. By the time night came, hunger drove me out of the school, but I did it warily, making sure nobody was in sight. The streets of the shopping center were more or less deserted. There was no sign of a restaurant. I was so empty that I felt dizzy as I hunted for one but then a shocking realization made me halt on the sidewalk and sweat with horror. Even if there had been a restaurant, what would I have used for money? Now I got the whole foul picture. She had sent old people back through time on errands like mine, and they'd starved to death because they couldn't buy food. No, that wasn't right. I remembered what I had told Lou Pape. Anybody who gets hungry enough can always find a truck garden or a food store to rob. Only I hadn't seen a truck garden or food store anywhere in this city. And I thought about people in the past having their hands cut off for stealing a loaf of bread. This civilization didn't look as if it went in for such drastic punishments, assuming I could find a loaf of bread to steal, but neither did most of the civilizations that practiced those barbarisms. I was more tired, hungry, and scared than I'd ever believed a human being could get. Lost, completely lost, 
in a totally alien world, but one in which I could still be killed or starved to death, and God knew what was waiting for me in my own time in case I came back without the information she wanted, or maybe even if I came back with it. That suspicion made up my mind for me. Whatever happened to me now couldn't be worse than what she might do. At least I didn't have to starve. I stopped a man in the street. I let several others go by before picking him deliberately, because he was middle-aged, had a kindly face, and was smaller than me, so I could slug him and run if he raised a row. "'Look, friend,' I told him, "'I'm just passing through town.' "'Ah?' he said pleasantly. "'And I seem to have mislaid—' "'No, that was dangerous. "'I'd been about to say I'd mislaid my wallet, "'but I still didn't know whether they used money in this era.' He waited with a patient, friendly smile while I decided just how to put it. "'The fact is that I haven't eaten all day, and I wonder if you could help me get a meal.' He said in the most neighborly voice imaginable, "'I'll be glad to do anything I can, Mr. Weldon.' My entire face seemed to drop open. "'You... you called me... Mr. Weldon?' he repeated, still looking up at me with that neighborly smile. "'Mark Weldon, isn't it? From the twentieth century?' I tried to answer, but my throat had tightened up worse than on any opening night I'd ever had to live through. I nodded, wondered terrifiedly what was going on. "'Please relax,' he said persuasively. "'You're not in any danger whatever. We offer you our utmost hospitality. Our time, you might say, is your time.' "'You know who I am,' I managed to get out through my constricted glottis. "'I've been doing all this running and ducking and hiding for nothing.' He shrugged sympathetically. Everyone in the city was instructed to help you, but you were so nervous that we were afraid to alarm you with a direct approach. Every time we tried to, as a matter of fact, you vanished into one place or another. We didn't follow for fear of the effect on you. We had to wait until you came voluntarily to us. My brain was racing again and getting nowhere. Part of it was dizziness from hunger, but only part. The rest was plain, frightened confusion. They knew who I was. They'd been expecting me. They probably even knew what I was after, and they wanted to help. Let's not go into explanations now, he said, although I'd like to smooth away the bewilderment and fear on your face, but you need to be fed first, then we'll call in the others, and I pulled back. What others? How do I know you're not setting up something for me that I'll wish I hadn't gotten into? Before you approached me, Mr. Weldon, you first had to decide that we represented no greater menace than May Roberts. Please believe me, we don't so he knew about that, too. "'All right, I'll take my chances,' I gave in resignedly. "'Where does a guy find a place to eat in this city?' It was a handsome restaurant with soft light coming from three-dimensional, full-color nature murals that I might mistakenly have walked into if I'd been alone. They looked so much like gardens and forests and plains. It was no wonder I couldn't find a restaurant or food store or truck garden anywhere. Food came up through pneumatic chutes in each building— I'd been told on the way over, grown in hydroponic tanks in cities that specialized in agriculture, and those who wanted to eat out could drop into the restaurant each building had. Each city had its own function. This one was for people in the arts. I liked that. There was a glowing menu on the table with buttons alongside the various selections. I looked starvingly at the items, trying to decide which I wanted most. I picked oysters, onion soup, breast of guinea hen under plexiglass, and was hunting for the tastiest and most recognizable dessert when the pleasant little guy shook his head regretfully and emphatically. "'I'm afraid you can't eat any of those foods, Mr. Weldon,' he said in a sad voice. "'We'll explain why in a moment.' A waiter and the manager came over. They obviously didn't want to stare at me, but they couldn't help it. I couldn't blame them. I'd have stared at somebody from George Washington's time, which is about what I must have represented to them. "'Will you please arrange to have the special food for Mr. Weldon delivered here immediately?' the little guy asked. "'Every restaurant has been standing by for this, Mr. Carr,' said the manager. "'It's on its way. Prepared, of course. It's been ready since he first arrived.' "'Fine,' said the little guy, Carr. "'It can't be too soon. He's very hungry.' I glanced around and noticed for the first time that there was nobody else in the restaurant. It was past the dinner hour, but even so there are always late diners. We had the place all to ourselves, and it bothered me. They could have ganged up on me, but they didn't. A light gong sounded, and the waiter and manager hurried over to a slot of a door and brought out a couple of trays loaded with covered dishes. "'Your dinner, Mr. Weldon,' the manager said, putting the plates in front of me and removing the lids. I stared down at the food. "'This,' I told them angrily, 
is a hell of a trick to play on a starving man. They all looked unhappily. Mashed dehydrated potatoes, canned meat and canned vegetables, Carr replied. Not very appetizing, I know, but I'm afraid it's all we can allow you to eat. I took the cover off the dessert dish. Dried fruits? I said in disgust. Rather excessively dried, I'm sorry to say, the manager agreed mournfully. I sipped the blue stuff in a glass and almost spat it out. Powdered milk? Are these things what you people have to live on? No, our diet is quite varied, Carr said in embarrassment, but we unfortunately can't give you any of the foods we normally eat ourselves. And why in blazes not? Please eat, Mr. Weldon, Carr begged with frantic earnestness. There's so much to explain. This is part of it, of course, and it would be best if you heard it on a full stomach. I was famished enough to get the stuff down, which wasn't easy. Uninviting as it looked, it tasted still worse. When I was through, Carr pushed silver buttons on the glowing menu. Dishes came up from an opening in the center of the table, and he showed me the luscious foods they contained. "'Given your choice,' he said, "'you'd have preferred them to what you have eaten. Isn't that so, Mr. Weldon?' "'You bet I would,' I answered, sore because I hadn't been given that choice. "'And you would have died like the pathetic old people you were investigating,' said a voice behind me. I turned around, startled. Several men and women had come in while I'd been eating, their footsteps as silent as cats on a rug. I looked blankly from them to Carr and back again. "'These are the clothes we ordinarily wear,' Carr said. "'An eighteenth-century motif, as you can see. Updated knee-breeches and shirt-waists, a modified stock for the men, the daring low bodices of that era, the full skirts treated in a modern way by using sheer materials for the women, bright colors and sheens, buckled shoes of spun synthetics, very gay, very ornamental, very comfortable and thoroughly suitable to our time. But everyone I saw was dressed like me, I protested, only to keep you from feeling more conspicuous and anxious than you already were. It was quite a project, I can tell you. Your styles varied so greatly from decade to decade, especially those for women, and the materials were a genuine problem. They'd gone out of existence long ago. We had the textile and tailoring cities working a full six months to close the inhabitants of this city, including, of course, the children, Everybody had to be clad as your contemporaries were, because we knew only that you would arrive in its vicinity, not where you might wander through the city. There was one small difference you didn't notice, added a handsome, mature woman. You were the only man in a gray suit. We had a full description of what you were wearing, you see, and we made sure nobody else was dressed that way. Naturally, everybody knew who you were, and so we were kept informed of your movements. What for? I demanded in alarm. What's this all about? Pulling up chairs, they sat down, looking to me like a witchcraft jury from some old painting. "'I'm Leo Blundell,' said a tall man in plum and gold clothes. "'As chairman of, of the Mark Weldon Committee, it's my responsibility to handle this project correctly.' "'Project? To make certain that history is fulfilled, I have to tell you as much as you must know. I wish somebody would.' "'Very well.' Let me begin by telling you much of what you undoubtedly know already. In a sense, you are more a victim of Dr. Anthony Roberts than his daughter. Roberts was a brilliant physicist, but because of his eccentric behavior, he was ridiculed for his theories and hated for his arrogance. He was an almost perfect example of self-defeat, the way in which a man will hamper his career and wreck his happiness, and then blame the world for his failure and misery. To get back to his connection with you, however, he invented a time machine. Unfortunately, its secret has since been lost, and never rediscovered, and used it for antisocial purposes. When he died, his daughter May carried on with his work. It was she who sent you to this time to learn the principle by which the Dynapack operates. She was a thoroughly ruthless woman. Are you sure? I asked uneasily. Quite sure. I know a number of old people died after she sent them on errands through time, but she said they'd lied about their age and health. One would expect her to say that, a woman put in cuttingly. Blundell turned to her and shook his head. Let Mr. Weldon clarify his feelings about her, Rhoda. They are obviously very mixed. They are, I admitted. She seemed hard the first time I saw her when I answered her ad, but she could have just been acting businesslike. I mean... She had a lot of people to pick from, and she had to be impersonal and make certain she had the right one. The next time, I hope you don't know about that, it was really my fault for breaking into her room. I really had a lot of admiration for the way she handled the situation. Go on, Carr encouraged me. And I can't complain about the deal she gave me. 
Sure, she came out ahead on the money I bet and invested for her, but I did all right myself. I was richer than I'd ever been in my life, and she gave that money to me before I even did anything to earn it. Besides which, somebody else said, she offered you half of the profits on the Dynapack. I looked around at the faces for signs of hostility. I saw none. That was surprising. I'd come from the past to steal something from them, and they weren't at all angry. Well, no, it wasn't really stealing. I wouldn't be depriving them of the Dynapack. It just would have been invented before it was supposed to be. She did, I said, though I wouldn't call that part of it philanthropy. She needed me for the data, and I needed her to manufacture the things. And she was a very beautiful woman, Blundell added. I squirmed a bit. Yes. Mr. Weldon, we know a good deal about her from notes that have come down to us among her private papers. She had a safety deposit box under a false name. I won't tell you the name. It was not discovered until many years later, and we will not voluntarily meddle with the past. I sat up and listened sharply. So that's how you knew who I was, and what I'd be wearing, and what I came for. You even knew when and where I'd arrive. Correct, Blundell said. What else do you know? that you suspected her of being responsible for the deaths of many old people by starvation. Your suspicion was justified, except that her father had caused all those that occurred before 1947, when she took over after his own death. All but two people were sent into the past. Roberts was curious about the future, of course, but he did not want to waste a victim on a trip that would probably be fruitless. In the past, you understand, he knew precisely what he was after. The future was completely unknown territory. But she took the chance, I said. If you can call deliberate murder taking a chance, yes. One man arrived in 2094, over fifty years ago. The other was yourself. The first one, as you know, died of malnutrition when he was brought back to your era. And what happened to me? I asked, jittering. You will not die. We intend to make sure of that. All the other victims... I presume you're interested in their errands? I think I know, but I'd like to find out just the same. They were sent to the past to buy or steal treasures of various sorts. Art, sculpture, jewelry, fabulously valuable manuscripts and books, anything that had great scarcity value. That's not possible, I objected. She had all the money she wanted. Any time she needed more, all she had to do was send somebody back to put down bets and buy stocks that she knew were winners. She had the records, didn't she? There was no way she or her father could lose. He moved his shoulders in a plum-and-gold shrug. Most of the treasures they accumulated were for acquisition's sake, and for the sake of vengeance for the way they believed Dr. Roberts had been treated. When there were unusual expenses, such as replacing the very costly parts of the time machine, that required more than they could produce in ready cash, both Roberts and his daughter discovered these treasures. He waited while I digested the miserable meal and the disturbing information he had given me. I thought I'd found a loophole in his explanation. You said people were sent back to the past to buy treasures, besides stealing them. I did, he agreed. They were provided with currency of whatever era they were to visit. I felt my forehead wrinkle up as my theory fell apart. Then they could buy food. Why should they have died of malnutrition? Because, as May Roberts herself told you, nothing can exist before it exists. Neither can anything exist after it is out of existence. If you returned with a Dynapack, for example, it would revert to a lump of various metals, because that was what it was in your period. But let me give you a more personal instance. Do you remember coming back from your first trip with dust on your hand? Yes, I must have fallen. On one hand, no, Mr. Weldon. May Roberts was greatly upset by the incident. She was afraid you would realize why the hamburger had turned to dust, and why the old people died of starvation. All of them, not just a few. He paused, giving me a chance to understand what he had just said. I did with a sick shock. If I ate your food, I said shakily, I'd feel satisfied until I returned to my own time, but the food wouldn't go along with me. Blundell nodded gravely, and so you too would die of malnutrition. The foods we have given you existed in your era. We were very careful of that, so careful that many of them probably were stored years before you left your time. We regret that they are not very palatable, but at least we are positive they will go back with you. You will be as healthy when you arrive in the past as when you left. 
Incidentally, she made you change your clothes for the same reason. They had been made in 1930. She had clothing from every era she wanted visited, and chose old people who would fit them best. Otherwise, you see, they'd have arrived naked. I began to shake as if I were as old as I'd pretended to be on the stage. She's going to pull me back. If I don't bring her information about the Dynapack, she'll shoot me. That, Mr. Weldon, is our problem, Blundell said, putting his hand comfortingly on my arm to calm me. Your problem? I'm the one who'll get shot, not you. But we know in complete detail what will happen when you are returned to the twentieth century. I pulled my arm away and grabbed his. You know that? Tell me! I'm sorry, Mr. Weldon. If we tell you what you did... You might think of some alternate action, and there is no knowing what the result would be. But I didn't get shot or die of malnutrition. That much we can tell you. Neither. They all stood up so bright and attractive in their colorful clothes that I felt like a shirt-sleeved stagehand who'd wandered in on a costume play. You will be returned in a month, according to the notes May Roberts left. She gave you plenty of time to get the data, you see. We propose to make that month an enjoyable one for you. The resources of our city, and any others you care to visit, are at your disposal. We wish you to take full advantage of them. And the Dynapack? Let us worry about that. We want you to have a good time while you are our guest. I did. It was the most wonderful month of my life. The mesh cage blurred around me. I could see May Roberts through it, her hand just leaving the switch. She was as beautiful as ever, but I saw beneath her beauty the vengeful, vicious creature her father's bitterness had turned her into. Blundell and Carr had let me read some of her notes, and I knew. I wished I could have spent the rest of my years in the future instead of having to come back to this. She came over and opened the gate, smiling like an angel, welcoming a bright new soul. Then her eyes traveled startledly over me, and her smile almost dropped off, but she held it firmly in place. She had to, while she asked, "'Do you have the notes I sent you for?' "'Right here,' I said. I reached into my breast pocket and brought out a stubby automatic and shot her through the right arm. Her closed hand opened and a little derringer clanked on the floor. She gaped at me with an expression of horrified surprise that should have been recorded permanently. It would have served as a model for generations of actors and actresses. "'You brought back a weapon!' she gasped. "'You shot me!' She stared vacantly at her bleeding arm and then at my automatic. "'But you can't... "'Bring anything back from the future. "'And you aren't dying of malnutrition.' "'She said it all in a voice shocked into toneless wonder. "'The food I ate and this gun are from the present,' I said. "'The people of the future knew I was coming. "'They gave me food that wouldn't vanish from my cells when I returned. "'They also gave me the gun instead of the plans for the Dynapack. "'And you took it?' she screamed at me. "'You idiot!' I'd have shared the profits honestly with you. You'd have been worth millions. With acute malnutrition, I amended. I like it better this way, thanks. Poor, but alive. Or relatively poor, I should say, because you've been very generous, and I appreciate it. By shooting me. I hated to puncture that lovely arm, but it wasn't as painful as starving or getting shot myself. Now, if you don't mind, or even if you do, it's your turn to get into the cage, Miss Roberts. She tried to grab for the derringer on the floor with her left hand. "'Don't bother,' I said quietly. "'You can't reach it before a bullet reaches you.' She straightened up, staring at me for the first time with terror in her eyes. "'What are you going to do to me?' she whispered. "'I could kill you as easily as you could have killed me. Kill you and send your body into some other era. How many dozens of deaths were you responsible for? The law couldn't convict you of them, but I can, and I couldn't be convicted either.' She put her hand on the wound. Blood seeped through her fingers as she lifted her chin at me. I won't beg for my life, Weldon, if that's what you want. I could offer you a partnership, but I'm not really in a position to offer it, am I? She was magnificent, terrifyingly intelligent, brave clear through, and deadlier than a plague. I had to remember that. Into the cage, I said. I have some friends in the future who have plans for you. I won't tell you what they are, of course. You didn't tell me what I'd go through, did you? Give my friends my fondest regards. If I can manage it, I'll visit them, and you. She backed warily into the cage. It would have been pleasant to kiss those wonderful lips goodbye. I'd thought about them for a whole month, wanting them and loathing them at the same time. 
It would have been like kissing a coral snake. I knew it, and I concentrated on shutting the gate on her. "'You'd like to be rich, wouldn't you, Weldon?' she asked through the mesh. "'I can be,' I said. "'I have the machine. I can send people into the past or future and make myself a pile of dough. Only I'd give them food to take along. I wouldn't kill them off to keep the secret to myself. Anything else on your mind?' "'You want me,' she stated. I didn't argue. "'You could have me.' "'Just long enough to get my throat slit or brains blown out. I don't want anything that much.' I rammed the switch closed. The mesh cage blurred, and she was gone. Her blood was on the floor, but she was gone into the future I had just come from. That was when the reaction hit me. I'd escaped starvation and her gun, but I wasn't a hero, and the release of tension flipped my stomach over and unhinged my knees. Shaking badly, I stumbled through the big, empty house until I found a phone. Lou Pape got there so quickly that I still hadn't gotten over the tremors, in spite of a bottle of brandy I dug out of a credenza. Maybe because the date on the label, 1763, gave me a new case of the shivers. I could see the worry on Lou's face vanish when he assured himself that I was all right. It came back again, though, when I told him what had happened. He didn't believe any of it, naturally. I guess I hadn't really expected him to. "'If I didn't know you, Mark,' he said, shaking his big, dark head unhappily, "'I'd send you over to Bellevue for observation. Even knowing you, maybe that's what I ought to do.' "'All right, let's see if there's any proof,' I suggested tiredly. "'From what I was told, there ought to be plenty.' We searched the house clear down to the basement, where he stood with his face slack. "'Christ!' he breathed. "'The annex to the Metropolitan Museum!' The basement ran the length and breadth of the house, and was twice as high as an average room, and the whole glittering place was crammed with paintings in rich heavy frames, statuettes, books, manuscripts, goblets and ewers and jewelry made of gold and huge gems, and tapestries in brilliant color, and everything was as bright and sparkling and new as the day it was made, which was almost true of a lot of it. "'The dame was loaded, and she was an art collector, that's all,' Lou said. "'You can't sell me that screwy story of yours. She was a collector, and she knew where to find things.' "'She certainly did,' I agreed." "'What did you do with her?' "'I told you. I shot her through the arm before she could shoot me, and I sent her into the future.' He took me by the front of the jacket. "'You killed her, Mark. You wanted all this stuff for yourself, so you knocked her off and got rid of her body somehow.' "'Why don't you go back to acting where you belong, Lou, and leave sleuthing to people who know how?' I asked, too worn to pull his hands loose. "'Would I kill her and call you up to get right over here? Wouldn't I have sneaked these things out first? Or, more likely, I'd have sneaked them out, hidden them, and nobody, including you, would know I'd ever been here. Come on, use your head. That's easy. You lost your nerve. I'm not even losing my patience. He pushed me away savagely. If you killed her for this stuff, or because of that crazy yarn you gave me, I'm a cop, and you're no friend. You're just a plain killer I happen to have known once, and I'll make sure you fry. You always did have a taste for that kind of dialogue. "'Go ahead and wrap me up in an airtight case. "'Have them throw the book at me, send me up the river, "'put me in the hot squat. "'But you'll have to do the proving, not me.' "'He headed for the stairs. "'I will. "'And don't try to make a break or I'll plug you "'as if I never saw you before.' "'He put in a call at the phone upstairs. "'I didn't give a particular damn who it was he'd called. "'I was too relieved that I hadn't killed May Roberts. "'Destroying anything that beautiful, however evil, "'would have stayed with me the rest of my life.' There was another reason for my relief. If I'd killed her and left the evidence for Lou to find, he'd never help me. No, that's not quite so. He'd probably have tried to get me to plead insanity on the basis of my unbelievable explanation. But most of all, I couldn't get rid of the look on her face when I'd shot her through the arm, the arm that was so wonderful to look at, and that had held a murderous little gun to greet me with. She was in the future now. She wouldn't be executed by them. They regarded crime as an illness— and they'd treat her with their marvelously advanced therapy, and she'd become a useful, contented citizen, living out her existence in an era that had given me more happiness than I'd ever had. I sat and tried to stupefy myself with brandy that should long ago have dried to brick hardness, while Lou Pape stood at the door with his hand near his holster and glared at me. He didn't take his eyes off me until somebody named Professor Jeremiah Aronson came in and was introduced briefly and flatly to me. Then Lou took him upstairs— 
It was minutes before I realized what they were going to do. I ran up after them. I was just in time to see Aronson carefully take the housing off the hooded motors and leap back suddenly from the fury of lightning sparks. The whole machine fused while we watched helplessly, motors, switches, panel, and mesh cage. They flashed blindingly and blew apart and melted together in a charred and molten pile. Rigged, Aronson said in the tone of a bitter curse. Set to short if it was tampered with. I wouldn't be surprised if there were incendiaries placed at strategic spots. Nothing else could have made a mess like this. He finally glanced down at his hand and saw it was scorched. He hissed with the realization of pain, blew on the burn, shook it in the air to cool it, and pulled a handkerchief out of his back pocket by reaching all the way around the rear for it with his left hand. Lou looked helplessly at the heap of cooling slag. "'Can you make any sense of it, Prof?' he asked. "'Can you?' Aronson retorted. "'Melt down a microtome or any other piece of machinery you're unfamiliar with, and see if you can identify it when it looks like this.' He went out, wrapping his hand in the handkerchief. Lou kicked glumly at a piece of twisted tubing. Aronson is a top physicist, Mark. I was hoping he'd make enough out of the machine to... Oh, hell, I wanted to believe you. I couldn't. I still can't. Now we'll have to dig through the house to find her body. You won't find it or the secret of the machine, I answered miserably. I told you they said the secret would be lost. This is how. Now I'll never be able to visit the future again. I'll never see them or May Roberts. They'll straighten her out, get rid of her hate and vindictiveness, and it won't do me a damned bit of good, because the machine is gone and she's generations ahead of me. He turned to me puzzledly. You're not afraid to have us dig for her body, Mark? Tear the place apart if you want. We'll have to, he said. I'm calling homicide. Call in the Marines. Call in anybody you like. You'll have to stay in my custody until we're through. I shrugged. As long as you leave me alone while you're doing your digging, I don't give a hang if I'm under arrest for suspicion of murder. I've got to do some straightening out. I wish the people in the future could take on the job. They could do it faster and better than I can. But some nice, peaceful quiet would help. He didn't touch me or say a word to me as we waited for the squad to arrive. I sat in the chair and shut out first him, and then the men with their sounding hammers and crowbars and all the rest. She'd been ruthless and callous, and she'd murdered old people with no more pity than a wolf among a herd of helpless sheep. But Blundell and Carr had told me that she was as much a victim as the oldsters, who died of starvation with the riches she'd given them still untouched, on deposit in the banks, or stuffed into hiding places, or pinned to their shabby clothes. She needed treatment for the illness her father had inflicted on her, but even he, they'd said, had been suffering from a severe emotional disturbance, and proper care could have made a great and honored scientist out of him. They told me the truth and made me hate her, and they told me their viewpoint and made that hatred impossible. I was here, in the present, without her. The machine was gone. Yearning over something I couldn't change would destroy me. I had no right to destroy myself. Nobody did, they told me, and nobody who reconciles himself to the fact that some situations just are impossible to work out ever could. I'd realized that when the squad packed up and left and Lou Pape came over to where I was sitting. "'You knew we wouldn't find her,' he said. "'That's what I kept telling you. "'Where is she?' "'In Port Said, exotic hellhole of the world, "'where she's dancing in veils for the depraved. "'Cut out the kidding. Where is she?' "'What's the difference, Lou? She's not here, is she?' "'That doesn't mean she can't be somewhere else, dead.' "'She's not dead. You don't have to believe me about anything else. Just that.' "'He hauled me out of the chair and stared hard at my face. "'You aren't lying.' he said. I know you well enough to know you're not. All right, then. But you're a damned fool to think a dish like that would have any part of you. I don't mean you're nothing a woman would go for, but she's more fang than female. You'd have to be richer and better looking than her, for one thing. Not after my friends get through with her. She'll know a good man when she sees one, and I'd be what she wants. I slid my hand over my naked scalp. With a head of hair, I'd look my real age, which happens to be a year younger than you, if you remember. She'd go for me. They checked our emotional quotients, and we'd be a natural together. The only thing was that I was bald. They could have grown hair on my head, which would have taken care of that. And then we'd have gotten together like gin and tonic. Lou arched his black eyebrows at me. They really could grow hair on you? Sure. Now you want to know why I didn't let them. I glanced out the window at the smoky city. That's why. They couldn't tell me if I'd ever get back to the future. 
I wasn't taking any chances. As long as there was a possibility that I'd be stranded in my own time, I wasn't going to lose my livelihood. Which reminds me, you have anything else to do here? There'll be a guard stationed around the house, and all her holdings and art will be taken over until she comes back. She won't. Or is declared legally dead. And me? I broke in. We can't hold you without proof of murder. Good enough. Then let's get out of here. I have to go back on duty, he objected. Not any more. I've got over fifteen thousand dollars in cash and deposits, enough to finance you and me. Enough to kill her for. Enough to finance you and me, I repeated doggedly. I told you I had the money before she sent me into the future. All right, all right, he interrupted. Let's not go into that again. We couldn't find a body, so you're free. Now what's this about financing the two of us? I put my fingers around his arm and steered him out to the street. The city has never had a worse cop than you, I said. Why? Because you're an actor, not a cop. You're going back to acting, Lou. This money will keep us both going until we get a break. He gave me the slit-eyed look he'd picked up in line of duty. That wouldn't be a bribe, would it? Call it a kind of memorial to a lot of poor innocent old people and a sick tormented woman. We walked along in silence out in the clean sunshine. It was our silence. The sleek cars and burly trucks made their noise, and the pedestrians added their gavel. But a good Stanislavski actor like Lou wouldn't notice that. Neither would I ordinarily, but I was giving him a chance to work his way through this situation. "'I won't hand you a lie, Mark,' he said finally. "'I never stopped wanting to act. I'll take your deal on two considerations. All right, what are they?' "'That whatever I take off you is strictly alone. No argument. What's the other?' He had an unlit cigarette almost to his lips. He held it there while he said, "'That any time you come across a case of an old person who died of starvation with thirty thousand dollars stashed away somewhere, you turn fast to the theatrical page and not tell me or even think about it. <laughs> I don't have to agree to that.' He lowered the cigarette, stopped, and turned to me. "'You mean it's no deal?' "'Not that,' I said. "'I mean there won't be any more of those cases.' Between knowing that and both of us back acting again, I'm satisfied. You don't have to believe me. Nobody does. He lit up and blew out a pretty plume, fine and slow and straight, which would have televised like a million in the bank. Then he grinned. You wouldn't want to bet on that, would you? Not with a friend. I do all my sure thing betting with bookies. Then make it a token bet, he said. One buck that somebody dies of starvation with a big poke within a year. I took the bet. I took the dollar a year later. End of The Old Die Rich by H. L. Gold Recording by Julie Carter